Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to one of the last editions of uh, Insights into the Agada. <clears throat> Before I begin, I just want to tell you that the other day, someone made a beautiful a gift to the center, recognizing that there are people that, for the first time, are going to have to have their Seder um, alone, usually maybe that 25-year-old uh, man or woman that's in working or medical school or a 20-year-old boy or girl that's in university and they're usually going to people for the theater or someone that's uh, uh, a little older. older. Or someone that's a little older. And, and, I hear Ample in here. Maybe you have two devices near you. Maybe that's why. Okay, I think I'm ready to go. So everyone still hears me, is that correct? And go like this if you hear me. Do you hear me? Okay, all right. So let's, uh, let me just uh, tell you that, <clears throat> that if, if you know anyone that, that uh, needs a Seder in a box, so basically the center got a donation of a Seder in a box. That's the Seder plate with all the things on it, ready to go, and two dinners, and matzah, and grape juice, and the center's not asking for money, it's a gift from someone, and um, <clears throat> Monday morning at 9 a.m., uh, around 30 Seder boxes coming to me from Toronto Kosher, it'll be germ-free, not near the carbon book, and they'll be very simple. Uh, if you know anyone, we have around seven more boxes left, if you know anyone that uh, needs a Seder in a box, um, please reach out to me. Let me know we have around seven boxes left. Again, we're not necessarily talking about people that are necessarily needy, but they need a Seder in a box. So um, it's not necessarily someone that's uh, impoverished. It's just someone that can't get and figure out how to make a Seder um, because they're by themselves and we're going to help them. So uh, please let me know. Okay, that's idea number one. Idea number two is that one of our favorite parts of the Seder is halach ma'anya, where we say, whoever is needy, let him come in and eat. And if you think about it, that prayer, that request, is one of really the most dynamic things you can think about within Judaism. Let's put this in perspective. You know, if I would uh, get out of jail, let's say, uh, God forbid, I was in jail for 20 years, so what would I do the first moment I got out of jail? What would you do if you ran out of jail? So you imagine some people, they run out, they get out of jail after 20 years. The first thing they do is they go to the bar. But the Jewish people were enslaved for hundreds of years. And what's the first thing that we do when we, we sort of recreate our experience? We say, how do we express our freedom? We don't express our freedom by going to a bar. We don't express our freedom by, by gluttony. How do we express our freedom? We express our freedom by saying, hey, now that I'm free, how can I help someone else? Because what a slave doesn't have is an opportunity to be a giver. A slave is just a piece of property. And so once we get out of Egypt, the first thing we do is halak ma'anya. Now that I've tasted freedom, I want to do something with it. I want to help someone else. So usually the biggest idea of halak ma'anya that we try to give over at the Seder is that, hey, this is an unbelievable thing. How do we show our freedom? We show our freedom by being a giver. That's an amazing thing. That's how a Jew shows their freedom. But this year is an answer to a question I've always had, because I think uh, how many people know how many cups of wine do we drink at the Seder night? We have four cups of wine. So why do we say halach ma'anya after the first cup? If we want the, the, the per person to come in, we want that person from the street to come in, and we want them to have a warm meal, yes, but we want them to also have matzah, uh, Mara and four cups of wine. So we're inviting, usually, I don't know if you ever think about this, the first thing we do is Kadesh, Orchatz, Karpas, Yachatz, Magid, Raksa, we sing that song. I actually go Kadesh, Orchatz, Karpas, Yachatz, that's how we sing it in the car from go home. But then we make Kiddush, and then after we make Kiddush, which is cup number one, we invite the person to come in. Well, if we invite him at that point, he's going to have matzah, he's going to have mar, he's going to have the main meal. But you know what he's not going to have? He's not going to have four cups of wine. 
My math says he's only going to have three cups of wine. So why are we inviting that person in 10 minutes into the Seder for the same price we can invite him in 10 minutes earlier and had him sing Kaddish Orchats with us, had him do the first cup of wine with us and get the four cups of wine. We're inviting that person in only having three cups of wine. So you'll say, all right, but you'll get him quickly a cup of wine. I, it doesn't say in the where when you invite the guy in, offer him that first cup. He's ready going to cup number two with the rest of us. Anyway, you hear the question? I think it's a good question. And I think that in honor of really the pandemic, I know we call it an honor, but dealing with the pandemic, we have to realize <coughs> that when we're inviting people to come in and relax, uh, we're not necessarily inviting, definitely not this year, but maybe every year, we're not inviting the stranger on the street. We're actually inviting our parents and our children that are at the Seder. And this year, even if you might just be with one other person, or you, you might be by yourself, the main thing at the Seder is to say, hey, come in and eat with us. But who are we talking to? It seems that we're talking to people at the Seder, because after all, not only inviting this person to come in after the first cup of wine, but do you open the door? I know we opened the door for Eli Yahoo, but is anyone opening the door to invite people in? Are we really inviting people in? If three people marched in right then at the Seder night, would be like, oh, ho, take a seat. That never happened. So really, we're telling the people at the Seder, Halach Ma'anya is not for the people on the street. Halach Ma'anya is for the people at the Seder already. And our job is to say, all of you at the Seder, relax. This is your home. So idea number one is Halach Ma'anya is not necessarily for the people on the street. Halach Ma'anya is, in fact, for the people at the Seder. Now, if I were to tell you who are the worst people of all time, okay, high up on the list, you would probably say the Houston Astros. Yeah, maybe. Okay, I don't know if you'd say the Houston Astros, but uh, probably you would say Haman, uh, Hitler, Yamak Shimo, curse be his name, uh, Paro. Is there any other really bad people of all time? If you know the Hanukkah story, you'd probably say Antiochus. Um, <coughs> been some famous anti-Semites in Jewish history, probably members of the KKK, David Duke. I don't know who are the people that have hated the Jews the most. If you made a list of top 10 worst people of all time, Paro, Haman, Hitler, Hamal I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, unfortunately, we can come up with a big list there. <clears throat> but you know who would not come on the list? I bet you if you, all of you, you went around your Seder and say, you know, who are the worst people of, of all time, who have been the worst to the Jewish people? I bet you on the Seder night, if you went around the room, probably 90% of the people would say uh, Hitler was the worst person of all time. I think, you may, can you think of someone worse than Hitler? Maybe a more sophisticated person would say one of Hitler's uh, henchmen, like Goebbels or someone, or Himmler, right? Maybe some people thinking out of the box would say Haman. And since you're asking at the Seder, Probably one or two people might even say Paro, but probably Hitler, Paro, maybe Haman, right? right? Am, I, am I right on this? Can you think of someone worse than those people? So the truth is, is that the Seder actually compares someone to Paro. Isn't that crazy? You're comparing saying Paro was bad, but this guy was worse. And I'm thinking, who's worse than Paro? But this Haggadah actually has a sentence that there is someone worse than Paro. Now I'm going to unmute. I want to see if anyone knows the answer to that question. Anyone knows the answer to that, that question? Who's worse than Paro? Who's worse than Paro? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? He's small. Aman. He's small. He's small. He's, 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 uh, he's an interesting guy, he's small. Anyone Can't else? be us. Can't be ourselves. No, you're not as good as Paro. I mean, I don't know you. I don't know no, if behind we, your closed if door. If we're able to be enslaved, if we allow ourselves to be enslaved. Okay, you could be your own worst enemy. I know I am. I just have five cookies. Anybody? Okay, so I'm going to tell you the answer. The answer starts with an L. Anyone want to say? Lavan. Lavan. There you go, baby. Lavan. Okay. Now. The Seder itself, the Haggadah itself says that you know who was, you know who was worse than Paro? 
was worse than Paro was Lavan. Now, one second here. Lavan, you read that story in the Chumash and you, and you hear how Yaakov wanted to marry Rachel and then Lavan came in and said, Rachel, you go away and I'm gonna have Leah come in and Yaakov married Leah and then he wound up marrying Rachel and then he wound up running away from his father-in-law. That Lavan, we don't really give him a lot of ink. We don't pay much attention to him. And that God itself says, that compared to Paro, Lavan was worse because Paro only wanted to kill the Jewish boys. Remember, if there was a boy born, he wanted to throw the boy into the Nile River. But Lavan, Bikesh, Lavan desired Laharo to kill Eshakol, everybody. Now, one second here. I know Paro wanted to kill the boys. So if there are 200,000 births that year, Love and kill, Paro killed 100,000 boys. But was Laban really killing everyone? Well, you'll say technically he tried to mess up because if, um, if he earlier in the poor story, when, when Eliezer came to actually marry Rivka to Yitzchak earlier in the story, not with Yaakov and Rachel and Leah. But when Eliezer came to marry not Laban's daughters, but Laban's sister, Laban tried, the story goes, that Laban tried to poison Avram's servant Eliezer. And if Avram's servant Eliezer died, there would never have been a match between Yitzchak and Rivka, and the Jewish people never would have been into existence. So that low-life Laban wanted to kill Eliezer, which would have messed up everything. So yes, he was a minor low-life for having Leah come into the bedroom instead of uh, Rachel. That's a minor low life. But he was a major low life for trying to poison Eliezer and thus negating the marriage of his sister to Abraham's son, Yitzchak. <clears throat> okay, Rabbi, you made a very good point. But I want to share with you something, that idea that I heard that always resonates with me. And I think that this is also the answer. What I just told you is legit, I believe, the simple explanation why Lavan was worse than Paro. What I'm going to tell you tonight is, I think, also another answer, another layer. Because when I, I grew up, I went to RJJ, which I said many times is, was one of the greatest Orthodox boys-only elementary school in Staten Island, New York, to my knowledge, the only one as well. And RJJ stood for Rabbi Jacob Joseph, the first and only chief rabbi of New York City and the school is named after him. And I went to a school, <coughs> maybe you did also, you went to camp where we always benched. In other words, we always had breakfast and lunch and the few times we had dinner in the school, we'd always bench out loud. And so I have the luxury of knowing benching by heart, Berkat Hamazon by heart. However, it's not such a luxury because since I know it by heart, I can do it by rote a lot better and I don't have lots of kavana necessarily intent mindfulness when I'm doing Berkat Hamazan. But Berkat Hamazan is a long thing. And, and if you know what I'm talking about, it's just in a sing song. I mean, I think 95% of the Jewish people go, Baruch Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam. But then you have other portions and you have a part that says, Bako Mikol Kol. I don't know if you know that part of benching it towards the end. Bakol, bikol, kol. That part actually says three kols. Bakol, mikol, kol. What is that going on in, in Berkat Hamazah? And the answer is, is that Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, all three said they had everything. I have an attitude that I have everything. Bakol, mikol, kol. Those are actually three quotes from our patriarchs. Each one at, at a time in their life, they said, I have everything. Now, you go to kids that have everything and do they, yes, do you have everything? Well, no, I don't have everything because I want the next thing. And you go to parents and they say, do you have everything? No, I, wanna, I want the next thing. I want a bigger than. I really want something more. But if you go to someone that's so grounded and so connected to the one above and they appreciate everything that they have, they can say they have everything. There's a famous story about someone that, that wanted to know who is blessed with everything. So the rabbi said, go to Reb Zusha. Go to the holy tzaddik Reb Zusha. Where does he live if he has everything? He lives in a big mansion. No, 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 he lives in the shul. He's so poor, he lives in the shul. So the, the scholar went and said, are you Reb Zusha? And he said, yes. And he says, well, 
I want to meet you because the great rabbi said that I should meet you because, because you're blessed with everything. And he says, yes, I am blessed with everything. I have nothing, but I have everything. Now, if you have that attitude, you're a winner. Now, Yaakov, when he was living with his father-in-law, his father-in-law tried to be a bad businessman with him and try to cheat him day in and day out. Every day he tried to cheat with him. But Yaakov kept his integrity. And I want to tell you something, <coughs> which is, uh, you know, the key is that once you sell out, there's no going back. You know, as a rabbi many times, I always, I've had to, and you in business, I've had to do things that I always wonder, you know, why am I doing this? I'm giving up my integrity. I have a friend, a dear friend, I don't even want to say what profession he is, but he worked for someone, and that person was committing minor fraud, not major fraud, minor fraud. And uh, my friend went to him and said, I cannot be a part of this. This is, this, is, this is fraud, minor fraud, major fraud, fraud is fraud, I cannot be a part of this. And he eventually uh, got fired, and he suffered lots of negative repercussions financially from it. And I always think that, wow, you know, here he needs to pay his mortgage, to pay for his kids. He could have looked the other way, and it wouldn't have mattered. It wasn't really on his dime. It wasn't on his watch. But he stood up to integrity. Because once you sell out, and we know it as adults, we know it as adults when we sell out, that it's a slippery slope. Once we sell out, you know, for the most part, it's over. We're sell out. And so... <clears throat> If Lovin was able to turn Yaakov into a sellout, if Lovin was able to turn Yaakov into someone that was going to out-cheat Lovin, you cheat me, I'll cheat you, then we would have lost everything. And so if you look back at the Haggadah, and the Haggadah says that Pyro was bad, he only wanted to kill the men. It doesn't say Lovin wanted to kill the men and the women. It just says Lovin wanted to uproot, what did he want to uproot? Everything. Not necessarily everything physical, but the attitude of I have everything. Yaakov and his father Yitzchak and his father, his grandfather Avram always had the attitude, I have everything. If you have that attitude, it's easy to live your life with integrity. But if you always think, I wish I had this, I wish I had that, I want more. It's not fair, someone else has something. If you're always wanting something else, it's very hard to live with everything. It's very hard to live with integrity. And so that was the goal. Paro was a tremendous Russia. He was the first big Russia we talk about. And then we talk about Haman and Antiochus until modern times Hitler. And we have so many other people. But if Lovin would have turned Yaakov into a soulless individual, where would we be as a nation? Right at the beginning, right at the inception as the Jewish people started, if Lovin turned Yaakov into a, a bed, soulless businessman and not our patriarch, where would we be? And so perhaps at the Seder, something that's not discussed a lot, but when you get to this point, you talk about integrity. You talk about the hundreds of thousands of Jews that when they came to this new country were willing to get fired every Friday because they didn't want to work on Shabbos. Where was their money coming from? They wouldn't know. And they'd go look for a job the next Sunday. The Jewish people in North America were built on people that had so much integrity that they wouldn't work on Shabbos knowing they had no way of making ends meet. And I just want to end off with one story about integrity. So this shul, one of our early donors was a guy by the name of Jack Weinbaum, a, a blessed memory, a tremendous man. You might see his name on a couple of buildings around the city. So he told me this story. When I was going to him and schmoozing him once at his house, I was on Maddox Drive, he showed me something that he kept in his safe. In his safe was a piece of paper that had his first great business deal. He made a business deal with the Reichmans. Everyone made money on it. And then Mr. Reichman walked into his house and he said, Jack, he said, you made all this money. He says, okay. And he takes out a pen and maybe on the back of an envelope, he starts writing, how much are you giving the yeshiva? How much are you giving the Beis Yaakov? And he right there, he wrote down all the charities that he felt that Jack Weinbaum was responsible in supporting because he had made so much money. And from all the things Mr. Weinbaum kept in his, in his, uh, in his safe, 
he kept this very item in his safe. The original envelope where he understood that if you make money, you have to give it. And I asked Jack, Mr. Weinberg, I said, how did you come across becoming partners with the Reichmans? Oh, that's, that's really cool to be partners with the Reichmans. And he said the following story. He said, the Reichmans picked me because one time I had a building and I sold it. And then it went down in price. Or went up in price. I forget the exact deal. But he could have gotten out of the building. Let's say he bought the million for a million dollars, then it went down and he could have gotten his deposit out. And he really, he really could have won the day on this deal. But he kept the original price because he knew that if he would renegotiate, it would cripple the person he was doing business with. And when the Reichmans heard about Mr. Weinbaum's integrity, they said, this is the man we want to partner with. And so sometimes we think having integrity means we lose. But in Jack Weinbaum's case, and I think in all of our cases, we know having, having integrity, we ultimately win for the long run. Okay, that's idea number two. Okay, one of my favorite parts of the Seder, I say that a lot, one of my favorite parts of the Seder, because I have around 72 favorite parts of the Seder. So one of my favorite parts of the Seder is when I take my pinky. Does it, you take this pinky or you take this pinky? Right, you know what I'm talking about with your pinky? You take your pinky and you put it in the cup. Now, some people, especially now in COVID-19, might be freaked out with germs. They might not do that, and I'm okay with that. So some people take 10 and they pour out. Who here does the pinky? Can you give me, can you show me your pinky, please? Anyone want to show me their pinky? There you go, Kathy, show me your pinky. That's a very nice pinky, right? Excellent, nice pinky, nice pinky, guys. I like that. Pinky, guys, I want only pinkies. Now, if you have a pinky, please, I, that's it, enough, guys. Don't, that, don't you have to put your pinky in your ear now, it's gross. But I, I don't know if you're gonna do that this year. Did anyone think about putting their pinky into the wine this year? I know, I thought, which, after COVID-19, which company, which, which group of people are gonna suffer the most? And I think it's going to be bowling alleys. I mean, the thought of me putting my fingers into a bowling ball with thousands of other people who put their finger in the bowling ball, and then I'm gonna take a stranger's shoes and put it on, you gotta be kidding me. I'm not going bowling for at least six or seven weeks after this pandemic ends. And you might pour out 10 and you might put in 10, but did you know that there's another time where you put your pinky into the wine? Does anyone know another time at the Seder we put our pinky into the wine? Yes, for the Yeser Makot. No, yeah, you do for the 10 Makot. But when else do you do it? Do, 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 that acronym? Anyone? Is it that so, acronym of the... So, Datsach Adash Vachav, that's sort of the 10 Makot. Oh, that's the, the same. That's sort of the same. But I'm going to throw at you something, which I think you know. Because before we do that, we have dumb. I'm not calling you guys dumb. I'm just saying that's the word dumb. Uh, dumb. Sephardea. No. Dumb. The Aish. The Timroth Ocean. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Blood. Fire. Columns of smoke. Before we get to blood frog flies, we're actually sticking our pinky into blood fire and columns of smoke. That's the truth. And you know it because now, hey, yeah, I do remember that. We do, we do do three pinkies before the 10 pinkies, before the three pinkies. We do that. So what is blood fires and columns of smoke? It's in the Haggadah. You can trust me on it. I think you remember from 12, year, 12 months ago. So on the one hand, you can say, well, before the plague, we really, really tortured those Egyptians. How did we torture them? Well, we took their land that they idolized and we made blood out of it and then we burnt it so we had blood of the paschal lamb we had the fire of the paschal lamb and then we had the columns of smoke of the paschal lamb now if you saw your idol being tortured like that that'd be so painful you like for you that'd be like a mini plague so before we even get to blood frogs and lice we're going to talk about the past, the lamb a little bit, and say, hey, that was also a play. That's one idea. But the idea that resonates with me is something more powerful, because this line actually does not come from the Chumash. This comes from a, a prophet 
one of the great prophets named Joel. I don't know if you know any Joels out there. Uh, <clears throat> um, obviously, humanity's favorite Joel is Billy Joel, but that's his last name. We're talking about a first name, Joel. And, and Joel wrote about the Messianic, he wrote about what's going to be down the road. And he writes, down the road, there's going to be a big war. And that war, as we call it, is going to be the war of, you got it, Gog Umagog. And when you translate Gog Umagog into English, it is Armageddon. And there's going to be lots of blood, fire, and columns of smoke. And, and what I learned from my father-in-law's rabbi, Rabbi Uziel Malevsky of Blessed Mary, chief rabbi of Mexico, became a rabbi in um, Thornhill <coughs> after he left Mexico, and his, as a son that's currently a rabbi in Toronto, uh, Bathurst and uh, Patricia at B'nai Torah. And he had a beautiful insight that every year I'm like, oh, what an insight. Someone tells you something and you don't forget it. And one time I heard from him, or I read it in his, his book, that, you know, if you're, a little, if you're a prophet, is anyone a prophet here? In fact, the last month and a half I've made zero profit. But if you are a prophet, um, I remember when I was in Israel during my gap year, a guy used to come in with a, like a shepherd outfit and he used to always promote Prophet's Pub, which was the bar down the block of Ben Yehuda. And he would say, the end is near, come have a beer at Prophet's Pub. Now it sounds like he'd make some good business. Um, so if you were a prophet, if you were a prophet and you were describing Armageddon, how would you describe, like, you know, when the, the rabbis say that we're going to go to Israel on the wings of eagles. Now, if you're a prophet and you're envisioning a plane 2,000 years ago, what are you going to tell your people 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years? Well, there's going to be a plane. No one knows what that plane it looks like. You say, well, it's going to be some mechanical instrument in the air. So when you say on wings of eagles uh, 2,000 years ago, you know, you can get your brain around that. You can visualize that. But maybe the prophet was not saying literally wings of eagles. He was talking about planes. But the only way for him to describe it are wings of eagles. So when the prophet's describing Armageddon, like this big battle at the end, uh, well, blood, you know, I can envision blood. Uh, fire, I can envision fire. But you know what's going to be in Armageddon? Likely, I don't know. I'm not a prophet. But when I'm envisioning Armageddon, I'm envisioning a nuclear war like Hiroshima, Nagasaki, like, oh, boom, 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 major, major nuclear bombs going on. That's what I'm envisioning in the last battle. And although I did not live during Hiroshima, Nagasaki, like you do have those videos and you do see those nuclear clouds. Does anyone know what those nuclear clouds are called? They're in English, they're called, of course, mushroom clouds. Mushrooms. They look like a big mushroom. Now, how do you say a mushroom, right? Uh, sorry, not how you say a mushroom, but you know what it looks like, right? That mushroom cloud, it looks like a date tree. Does that, can anyone visualize that? A mushroom cloud, you know, columns of smoke, but then a big umbrella on top, like a cauliflower. It looks like a date tree. Now let's go back to the words. The prophet Joel said there's going to be blood, fire, and columns, timrot ocean. What's timrot from the word tamar? It's going to be a column of a tamar, of a day tree. Perhaps the prophet Joel was talking about something extraordinary. He was talking about mushroom clouds. But how can he explain mushroom clouds to the people that lived 2,500 years ago? So he says, I'm going to just call it Timrot Oshed, columns of mushrooms, of, of day trees. And hopefully there'll be a time where people will actually have that message. They'll be able to not only you know, picture it in a silly way, but picture it in a, in a real way, a more profound way. Okay, that's idea number three. Now, I want to tell you something that one of my favorite songs in the world is Shana Habab Yerushalayim. You know, when we get to it on Yom Kippur, it's a euphoria. When we get to it on the Pesach Seder, it also means like job well done, we did it, like, you know, we made it. Um, I don't know if many of you know, but I, I've run a marathon, and uh, two, I know I've run two, I don't want to brag. I mean, I just brag, but I don't want to brag, it just have to, I have to brag. But the big thing about a marathon is, if you, basically, when you're at the end, the last four blocks, there's so many people cheering, it's almost like you crossed the finish line already. 
because everyone's hollering and everything. And actually, the last marathon I ran, Rifki was uh, waiting like uh, seven or eight blocks before the finish, and I saw her, and it was just this unbelievable feeling. <coughs> so Lashana Haba is almost like at the end, but did you know that Lashana Haba is nowhere, that sentence is nowhere found in the Chumash. That sentence is nowhere found in the prophets. It's nowhere found in the writings. It's not found even in the Talmud. Isn't that crazy? Like the most famous sentence at the Seder, the most famous sentence on Yom Kippur, the song we sing all the time, L'Shana Haba Yerushalayim, is not really found till like 500 years ago. So what is the deal with L'Shana Haba Yerushalayim? I'm going to tell you. So we have in the beginning of the Seder, all the rabbis, Rabbi Akiva hosting the Seder, he was in B'nai Brak, and mind you, he was in B'nai Brak before the pandemic, or else he would have had no one at his Seder. But this was way before the pandemic. We actually think it was during the Bar Kokhba revolt. But in any event, Rabbi Akiva was having a Seder in B'nai Brak, and he had all these rabbis around him. I have one question, a question which I'm sure you've never asked, which is, why did he not invite the leader of the Jewish people? What do you mean, why did he invite the leader of the Jewish people? Those are the people at the Seder. Why did he invite him? Why did he invite him? That's a silly question. He didn't invite, he can't invite everyone. Well, a lot of times Rebbe Akiva is holding court and there's usually Rebbe Gamliel. He's usually, the, he's usually in this group of people. So Rebbe Gamliel is usually in this group of people. Why is he not there? It seems like he's being ignored. The truth is, is that Rabbi Gamliel and the rabbis argue a lot about the nature of what we're supposed to do tonight. Because if I were to tell you, it's an either or, it's a, it's a, it's a this or that. If I was to say, raise your hands, <clears throat> what is the main part of the Seder? And I'll give you two choices. The main part of the Seder is to recount the Exodus, okay? Or the main part of the Seder is to talk about the Paschal Lamb. So uh, I think if I'd ask everyone to raise their hand, you would say, well, the main part of the Seder is, of course, the Exodus. Duh, right? The God of Tilabim, you should tell your children, right? Why did this happen? We left Egypt and blood and frogs and lice and blah, 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 blah. That's why we go, Rabbi. Well, I get it, but there is a Rabbi in the Haggadah that says, time out. You know, in basketball, if you want to call a full time, you go like this. But if you're only calling a 20-second timeout, you go like that. So I'm going to go like that now. But timeout, that's not the only uh, position. If you look at the Haggadah, there's a Rabbi Gamliel, the Rabbi Gamliel that wasn't invited to the meal in B'nai Brak, who says, no, 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 there are three things you got to discuss at the Seder. If you got those three things, you win. If you don't get those three things, you lose. Remember that? Rabbi Gamliel Omer, and we actually point to the matzah and point to the matzah. Rabbi Gamliel, I'm there. Rabbi Gamliel says, if you don't discuss Pesach, matzah, and mar, you struck out. One second. We just went through the entire story of the Exodus, blood, frog, lice, and all these different things, and how we went down, we were just 70 people, and power threw us in the Nile River, blah, 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 all these things. But Rabbi Gamliel says, time out. That's a 20 second time out. What's going on? No, 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 you don't got to really discuss that. The main thing you got to discuss are Pesach, Matz, and Marwa. It's basically, it's just the Paschal Lamb. That's the main thing you have to discuss. In fact, if you look at the Talmud constantly, Rabbi Gamliel is the one that's saying, go ahead and act as if you have a Paschal Lamb. I want you to know that in many people's homes, I'm not asking you to break tradition, but in many people's homes, we go out of our way not to have roasted meat at the Seder. Now, I know for many of you, that would be like, how can I not have like roasted meat? But you should know a good chunk of the Jewish people have chicken or, or other types of meat. We do not have roasted meat at the Seder. Why is that? Well, the main reason is we don't have that is because why would we pretend that we're bringing a Paschal lamb? A Paschal lamb was, a, was barbecued. Why would we do that? We don't, we're not living in temple times. And so a good portion of the Jewish community has chicken, we have stuff, we do not have roasted meat, roasted meat, because we don't want to say, hey, we're having a Paschal lamb, but you can't have a Paschal lamb because you live in the diaspora. Even if you live in Israel, there's no temple, so you're not allowed to have uh, roasted meat. Rabbi Gamliel, knock yourself out, have roasted meat. Why is it? Why is it that Rabbi Gamliel is so into a roasted meat, in fact, that same story that we read about in the Haggadah of Rabbi Akiva and his, 
and his colleagues discussing leaving in Egypt, there's actually another source, Eber ben Gamliel, having an all-night discussion discussing the laws of Pesach, i.e. the Paschal Lamb. So when I ask you, what is the main focus of the Seder night? You'd say, well, the main focus is the Exodus. I would say, listen, according to the Akiva, and according to everything you've been told up until this moment in your life, the main part of the Haggadah is the Haggadah, the Magid, telling over the story. But if I were to ask Rabbi Gamliel his opinion on how to express the greatness of the Seder night, he would say, yes, discuss the Exodus, but that's not the main part. The main part is Pesach, Matzah, and Mar. The main part is the Paschal Lamb. Now you'll say, Rabbi Gamliel, your position is, is so sad. We don't have a Paschal Lamb anymore. You know what he'll tell you? He'll tell you, what do you mean? The exodus of Egypt is in the past. I'm not backwards thinking. In fact, I'm forward thinking because we're not gonna have an exodus of Egypt ever again. But you know what we're gonna have again? We're gonna have a Paschal Lamb again. When are we gonna have it? I don't know. But maybe next year in Jerusalem, we're gonna have the Paschal Lamb. So perhaps when Lashana Habab Yushalayim was created, it wasn't to accommodate the Rabbi Akiva people that were focused on leaving Egypt and focusing on the Seder experience being about the Exodus, but it was to accommodate the position of Rabbi Gamliel that says, we're gonna have a pass the lamb again, my friends. Lashana Habab Yushalayim. In fact, I can go a step further. You know, we always talk about the first part of the Seder and the second part of the Seder, <coughs> which is ridiculous because when I was a kid, I was like, well, the first part is like 95%. And the last part's 5%. So I never got that. But <clears throat> the first part of the Seder before the main meal, and then you have the stuff after the main meal, which basically in every house is sung and basically 10 to 20 minutes, 10 to 10 minutes, half an hour for the part after the main meal. Does anyone go past a half an hour on that? That would be really tremendous. Um, I mean, this is after the Afi Coleman negotiations, but <clears throat> the first half, um, we discuss the number 15 a lot. We have, you know, Kadej Orchat is 15, and we have 15 Dayenus. 15 is a big number in Judaism. It's half the name of God. If you take God's main name, which is a Yud and a He, and, and then a Vav, and then a He, you add that up all together, the four letter name of God, the first two letters are 15. Uh, but that's only half the name of God. God willing, we're going to have the whole name of God. As we say at the end of Elenu, Bayomahu on that day, yeah, Hashem Echad, Hashem will be one, because everyone, Ushemo Echad, and his name will be one, because everyone's going to recognize him. It's not going to be, I only see half a God, I only see a Yud and a He, I see the whole God. Well, if you take God's whole name, Yud and a He, and then above and a He, it's 26. And where do you find the number 26? I see, you said, fine, you find 15 a lot. You find 15 with the Kaddish Orchats, you have 15 parts, you have 15 Dayenus, you also have 15 stairs going into the temple, 15 stairs. And those are the Shir HaMalot. Shir HaMalot, you have 15 of those. So 15 is a big number. But at the, and, and the truth is, if you look at the entire Seder before the meal, all you're doing is talking about leaving Egypt. And even the part of Halal, which is before the main meal, that says Yisrael Mimitz Ryan, you're talking about leaving Egypt. So it's a lot about leaving Egypt. But if you actually spent, you know, if we, if we spent a little bit, if, we, if our eyes are a little bit awake, at the, after the main meal, we get to the part of the Seder where we don't discuss Egypt at all. Isn't that crazy? We don't discuss Egypt at all. You know, we discuss the Messianic era. Wow, that's the half part of the Seder, because that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is not leaving Egypt. It's the Messianic era. And you know how many Kili Olam Chastos are there? In Menarshal, we sing it. How many Kili Olam Chastos are there? You got it. There's 26 Kili Olam Chastos because 15 represents half of God's name, but 26 represents all of God's name. It's all coming together. <clears throat> that's the Messianic era. And that's why I believe that even though <clears throat> we live in a Rabbi Akiva world and we discuss leaving Egypt, Let's not forget the Paschal Lamb because Lishana Habab Yerushalayim, there's going to be a time next year, and it should come soon in Yerushalayim where we're going to follow Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel is getting us so excited. Rabbi Gamliel says, Don't only look at the past. 
Before my last idea, I just want to end this idea with the great comment of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, former chief rabbi of England. I love this line. I wish I, I knew. I wish I knew it by heart. I might have to look. But his line, and I've read it many times, is Judaism <coughs> is the only religion where its golden age is in the future. Let me repeat that. Judaism is the only religion where the golden age is in the future. How cool is that? Okay, last idea, and then I think I'm gonna have some beer. Okay, here's my last idea. I'm not the best Jew in the world, although I play one on TV, okay? When I see a mitzvah, I like to do it. I like to finish it up. I don't like doing half mitzvahs. When I get a chance to do a mitzvah, I do the whole mitzvah. I mean, can you imagine someone eating matzah, gets a board of matzah, and he eats it, and he says, well, I'll eat the rest in two hours. You know, you eat that matzah, you eat that mar. Imagine someone shaking lulos. He shakes it there, and then he puts it down, and then he shakes it there. You get the mitzvah, you do the mitzvah. Now, I know that some mitzvahs take 100 years, like honoring your parents, and some mitzvahs only might take a second, like putting money into the pushka. But if you can knock off the mitzvah, knock it off. Not knock it off in the sense of like, knock it off, don't care about it, but do it. There's reason Matim and the mitzvahs, we believe in like doing the mitzvah, not tarot. So why is it that when we have the matzah, bang, zoom, we do it. We have the maror, bang, zoom, we do it. In fact, the sandwich korech, which is a fascinating idea, korech is saying the matzah and the mar have to come together. We, we as Jews don't believe there's no silver lining in things, says Hillel. Even mar, you know, can have some matzah with it. There's no 100% mar in your life. That was Hillel's contribution. And even though we don't usually have minority positions at the Seder, like this is how we do it, we still say, hey, we're going to go with Hill a little bit. <clears throat> Over here, we're going to accommodate his position as well. But why is it that the four cups of wine are not done back to back to back to back? I know you're thinking, well, duh, if it, if you're going to get drunk. Okay, maybe you get drunk. But I like my question. Why is it that, that we have at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, whenever we're starting the Seder, and then a half an hour later, then a half an hour later, then a half an hour later, like, boom, let's knock it off. So, yeah, you'll say, Rabbi, the four cups represent four parts of redemption. And if we had them back to back to back to back, it would just look like you're a shikr or you're a drunk. The only way to show that you're drinking for the mitzvah is to space them out a bit. Okay, that's a good answer. But I want to share with you a beautiful answer that I heard this year. And that is as follows, is that at each stage of your life, you need to stop and enjoy the moment. I remember so much, always as a little kid thinking, when is going to be my bar mitzvah? And then when I got into high school, when am I going to get out of high school and have my gap year in Israel? And then when I had my gap year in Israel, I said, you know what, when am I going to like really start life and like, you know, your gap year is just like sort of high school. It's sort of, you know, still with your old friends. And like, when am I, when am I going to get married? You know, when am I going to be blessed with uh, my first job and to start my family? When am I going to become a Zaydi? You know what the Haggadah says, my friends? Every point in your life requires you to have a cup of wine. When you have wine, you connect with more your senses and you feel things more. And I think we're always in a stage, every pace off of this idea of running around. And we're running to the Seder. How many Seders, even if you're hosting, you're a guest, there's so much activity with the Seder experience. Who's coming? Who's not coming? Oh, they canceled. Oh, they're coming. They come every year and they don't even help and they leave and they eat and they complain and they're bitter. The bitter herb should have been named after that couple that always comes, my cousin, my aunt. Who's coming? Who's not? The drama. And how much preparation? I have to have eight dishes. And we're, in one way, we're blessed this year. We don't have any of that activity. All we have are the people at our own Seder experience. And I think that's the greatness of this Seder. Have your four cups of wine. Embrace 
where however old you are, embrace that time. And I think that as we go through the four stages of Exodus, each stage requires its own reminiscence and its own cup of wine, because wine brings that out. And don't just chug four cups of wines in a row. Don't go through life like that. At each stage, have a cup of wine and take it in. And I think for us, anyone that's my age, you're 20 years older, you're 20 years younger, whoever you are, but we're alive. And if we are Hashem gave us this time on earth, then we don't have to worry about what's going to be in five years from now, what's going to be in 10 years from now. Am I going to have enough money after COVID-19 to do X, Y, and Z? Am I? There's a lot of scary things out there. But I know one thing is that we're alive, we're having our Seder, and we don't have any of the tumult we normally have. So let's have our cup of wine slowly. Let's enjoy it. And let's enjoy every aspect of our life. And don't always think about what's going to be, um, what's going to be in 10 years from now. Let's just take it slow. And that's why I believe that we're having the four cups of wine separated to tell us, take your time, drink your wine, and take in the moment, the here and now. So Hashem should bless us that, that uh, we should remember all these lessons. We should remember the lessons of Halak Ma'anya, let everyone come in and eat. Usually that's to other people. This year, it's for the people at our Seder. And we remember that who's worse than Haman and Paro and Hitler, Yamach Shemov? It's good old Laban, because he wanted to destroy Yaakov's character. He wanted to destroy his integrity. And that would have been really halushas for the Jewish people. And then we discuss this amazing idea of blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Not pillars of smoke, pillars of tamar, of a mushroom cloud, of a date tree. And that's what the prophet Joel was talking about. And then we discussed this amazing idea of Rabbi Gamliel's influence on the Seder, that it's not just about the Exodus, it's about the Paschal Lamb. And that's why we say Lashana Habab Yerushalayim, because we believe there's going to be a time we're going to have the Paschal Lamb again. And, and the great comment that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And, and we ended with this last idea, this beautiful idea of wine being over the Seder, because each stage of your life, your first stage, your second stage, your third stage, your fourth stage, every stage of your life requires a bottle of wine to sit and relax and to take things in and to enjoy God's blessing. So I want to wish everyone an amazing Seder. If there's anyone that needs a Seder in the box, please let me know. I love you all. And as Tito Santani used to say at the end of WWF, Yariba, if anyone knows that. <laughs> my friends. All the best, everyone. A good night. Lila Beautiful. Thank oh, yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah.